Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Malignant, released in 2021. Malignant is a wild ride, y'all. An absolute blast from start to finish. It's melodramatic, by which I mean it's over the top in every way. Violence, action, performances, and especially storyline. Everything's campy and cranked to 11, but it's portrayed with technical mastery from director James Wan, a bona fide modern day horror legend. This dude gave us Saw and Insidious with Lee Winnell, and if those weren't enough, he also made The Conjuring. With The Conjuring, Wan proved he could create a top-tier mainstream horror movie for a general audience. With Malignant, he created a horror movie for horror fans. Malignant don't care about mass appeal. It's a love letter to the genre films that influenced Wan's career. It's Jalo by way of Henenlotter. It don't give a fuck, and it is awesome. Filled with cheesy one-liners, crazy camera movements, and a bloody balls-to-the-walls third act, Malignant follows a woman who starts having disturbing visions of a series of murders. That dry synopsis doesn't even begin to do the movie justice. There are so many cool ideas and moments. I'm shocked and glad Juan didn't limit himself when it came to using them. If you haven't gotten Malignant spoiled for you yet, I strongly encourage you to pause this video and go watch it for the first time. I really wish I could again. It's a non-stop parade of what the fucks and is this serious. Will a James Wan G- The subject suffers from late stage hair growth. The situation is dire. We have no choice but to treat him with today's sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped's performance package will cover the entire procedure from head to toe. We'll start by trimming the surface hair with the Lawn Mower 4.0. And now the Weed Whacker for those hidden hairs. Next, the Nail Kit. Very important. And finally, the Crop Preserver Deodorant and Crop Reviver Spray. Um, maybe we can do that part later. Suit yourself. Save that for me. I like how it smells. We're of course happy to report he's made a full recovery. We've sent him on his way with a full performance package kit, a free travel bag, and anti-chafing boxers. So this never happens again. Huh, that was weird. Take care of all your grooming needs by going to manscaped.com and using promo code KILLCOUNT20 to get 20% off your order plus free international shipping. Will the James Wan Giallo leave our black gloves bloody or will it keep our hands clean like a conjuring film? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins in 1993 at the Simeon Research Hospital. I believe it's their Gotham branch. In a Command and Conquer cutscene, Dr. Florence Weaver describes one of the patients there named Gabriel. She says Gabe's getting too strong to contain, like a super intelligent backwards swimming shark. Sure enough, before long, she's getting a red alert. Gabriel's getting rowdy, busting up people's bones and every damn light in the building. Dr. Weaver moldoons a sedative into him off screen and enters the room to find the bodies of a doctor and two nurses. Despite Gabriel's cute panda booties, it's determined he's a lost pause. It's time we cut out the cancer. And we ain't talking benign, we talking title card. And some opening credits with bad tracking. Anyone got a head cleaner? Nearly 30 years later, in present day, pregnant protagonist Madison Lake Mitchell arrives at her patented James Wan home. Those big wooden old fashioned houses that always seem to come pre-haunted. No ghosts or demons here, but the place is haunted by a super shitty husband. Derek is so over the top awful that he makes Maddie work the late shift so he can stay home watching MM he starts griping about her previous two pregnancies, which both ended in miscarriages. Maybe you need to stop getting pregnant. And maybe you need to stop putting your shoes on the bed, mister! Thing is, Derek's also one legitimately scary son of a Hermes. Heads up for domestic abuse, because he quickly gets violent with Madison. It's almost certainly not the first time, but it may just be the last. That night, Derek's sleeping on the couch when he's awoken by the sound of a blender. But no one's getting unfriended tonight, it's simply TV time. And who's being a creepy couch potato? Noob Cybot? Well, you're just gonna channel surf or. Nope, never mind, he's gone. But not forgotten. 
The shadowy figure attacks Derek from behind, and when Maddie gets up later, she finds her shitty husband with a sick crick in his neck. Guess Michael's gonna need to find another vessel. His Cairo killer appears and chases her upstairs, then pulls a Dylan slash roses, knock knock knocking her to the floor. Hi. Hi, 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 yeah. Maddie wakes up in the hospital where her younger sister Sydney says the attack has resulted in another miscarriage. For Malignant to work, the actors have to take everything seriously. Annabelle Wallace does a great job leading the way. She had previously starred in Annabelle, which James Wan produced. Back at the house, we kick off the cop plot, just like in Saw. Hell, they even get the Saw green lighting sometimes. Look at this place. I bet Donnie Wahlberg's in the other room. Detective Kakoa Shaw learns from his partner Regina Moss that the killer didn't leave fingerprints and that their handprints were upside down. She also thinks the Spidey killer may have been Maddie herself. No forced entry, an abusive husband. Motive. Two weeks later, Sydney takes her sister home from the hospital. Maddie insists on staying by herself, a decision she regrets that night when she spots a figure under a street lamp. And I don't think it's a deluminating Dumbledore. Terrified, Maddie hotline Miami's her way upstairs in an amazing tracking shot. The interior of the house was built on a soundstage, allowing Juan to shoot from overhead. He compared it to cutting the roof off a dollhouse. The top-down view was achieved with a spider cam, a camera on a cable system often used for sporting events. I freaking love this shot. It's so unique. Great job, fellow James. When the house falls silent, Maddie thinks she's just hearing things. It's all in my head. It's all in my head. But she still makes like a Kevin McAllister and montages her house shut. There, that'll keep out the Nazi zombies. Sydney sams her way inside to hear Maddie explain it all. And her sister says she wanted to have a baby so she could have a biological relative. This revelation makes Sydney shit her fucking pants. Sydney, I'm adopted. Oh my god, and the Pixies cover by Safari Riot? Hell yeah! Sydney's brain just got freshly squeezed. The movie reminds us it's set in Seattle with some B-roll, even though it was mostly shot in Los Angeles over two and a half months in late 2019. We're still on an LA set when we move below the surface to the Seattle underground, but this place is real. It's a portion of the original city that was abandoned after new streets were built on top. I'm sure that it's just a fun setting to include though, and not foreshadowing anything. Not at all. A cardigan-clad tour guide closed closes up shop for the night, but before she can get back home to Iceman, she's attacked by an above-ground assailant. She comes to in a hideout with an industrial fan, the Chucky Choppin' Size. Her knockoff neo-kidnapper speaks through a nearby radio. I can't tell you how long I've waited for this. Man. ACL's gotten weird. The mystery man makes a phone call to Dr. Weaver, that woman from the opening that took place in 93. Dr. Weaver. Yes? It's time to cut out the cancer. What? <laughs> Lady, why are you acting like you're not talking to Dr. Claw? I guess it's just professional courtesy. Back at Maddie's house, things are getting a little insidious between the spooky radio music and Tiny Tim's. <laughs> Get out of here, you rascal! She tries to do her laundry, but finds a wailing weaver in the washer window. Wow! The leather-clad killer appears and attacks the doctor, and as Maddie sits paralyzed, she's transported to Weaver's house in a mesmerizing and memorable visual effect. With Maddie helplessly watching, the figure grabs Weaver's medical award and Romper stomps her onto the kill count. This sick, gory Weaver was a literal trophy kill. Maddie wakes up on her kitchen floor, but she didn't just dream that kill graphic, because Kakoa and Moss are already at the very real crime scene. Are these two the only homicide detectives in Seattle? Or is everyone else on the Rosie Larson case? They meet up with a crime scene technician named Winnie, played by Romanian actor Ingrid Bisu. Bisu appeared in The Conjuring 3 and The Nun, which is where she first met James Wan. She's also an executive producer of Malignant and came up with the concept in the first place. She developed the story with Wan, who is her husband in real life. So it's kind of hilarious that her character is super horned up for Kakoa. You're yeah, gonna find that missing half. Yeah, don't we all? Winnie believes that whoever killed Weaver is also behind Derek's death. She notes the murder weapon was Weaver's Staff of Hermes statue, which was visible in her video diary at the start of the film. It's currently missing its top half, though, since it's back in the industrial fan club, getting pounded into an awesome giallo jabber. In a less grungy part of Seattle lives Dr. Victor Fields. He was Dr. Weaver's colleague at Simeon, and is now worried that her death was targeted. Foreboding static cuts his phone call short, but the sequence is all build up and no bite, since Fields gets in bed without his ankle getting hostile. The only person getting jump scared here is Maddie, who finds herself as Fields' unwitting bedfellow. The leather-clad figure appears and clambers over Maddie like he were Samara coming out the well. Ugh. 
I bet that hair smells like sour, you know? The killer starts riding fields like a cowboy and gets this rodeo started by stabbing the dude's face, leaving behind a Socrates pool of blood. The figure turns towards Maddie, but she strikes out of her dream of fields before she can get a closer look. Wink! Her screaming gets the attention of Sydney, who's been staying with her ever since Dr. Weaver's murder. She takes her sister down to the police station, where she suggests Maddie might have developed a psychic bond with the killer. The detectives are dubious, but Maddie remembers a last night in Soho sign outside Fields' window, so she's able to take them to the alleged crime scene. Kakoa and Ma search the building and find Dr. Fields' house-sized penthouse apartment. Being a black market surgeon sure does pay well. They also find the doctor himself, although it looks like he won't be getting another regeneration cycle. Back at the station, Maddie provides a description of the murderer. So I'm putting out a bolo on sloth from the Goonies. This movie makes me laugh often and a lot, but special shout out to Michelle Brianna White as Detective Regina Moss. She and George Young do a great job delivering all this hard-boiled dialogue. While Juan and Bisu developed Malignant's story, the actual script was written by Akela Cooper, a screenwriter whose only other feature had been 2018's Hellfest. The next movie she's written is freaking Megan. I can't wait. Maddie excuses herself to go to the bathroom, a perilous decision in a James Wan film. Right on Q, the lights flicker, and Maddie gets a sinister phone call. Hello? Hello. Yeah, he said Emily, but this ain't no wrong number. Megatron tells Maddie that's her birth name, and he would know as a figure from her pre-adoption past. Reaching down into her subconscious caller ID, Maddie pulls out the caller's name too. Gabriel, no! The killer is, of course, Gabriel, whose gravelly vocals were provided by prolific anime voice actor Ray Chase. Dude did a great job presenting at the Dead Meat Horror Awards. His staticky, broken voice for Gabriel is similar to the Phantom's voice in Phantom of the Paradise. A shaken Maddie grabs her sister, who's going cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Oh, I'll see you around, okay? <laughs> Join the club, lady. After they leave, Kakoa has a conversation with Bosco, another officer in this Art Deco precinct. Earlier, Kakoa had asked him to age up a photo they had found at Dr. Weaver's. It was a patient she had, and the aged up version <laughs> is just a straight up photo of Maddie. <laughs> she was the doctor's patient. <laughs> yep, dude. What gave it away? That precog printout you're holding? Maddie and Sydney visit their mother, Jean, who says she doesn't know anything about Maddie's pre adoption life. Still, the mention of Gabriel sends her into a dramatic close up. Whoa! She plays for them some old home videos, which show a young and still restless Maddie. You can tell by the bangs. Or maybe you can't, since almost every single woman in this movie has bangs. They are that on which the world hangs, I guess. They see her talking to an imaginary friend. A friend named... Gabriel. Should have left that one at Foster's. Kakoa discovers flash drives in Dr. Weaver's belongings, one of which contains a video of her with a nod to Aquaman, another James Wan film. He also finds a weirdly photoshopped picture of Weaver, Fields, and a third doctor named John Gregory. Surmising that Johnny Greggs is gonna be the next victim, Kakoa Googles his home address and rushes off to warn him. Better hurry, dude, since Maddie's already facing mirror images that aren't her own and Quantum bleeding into the doctor's bathroom. Gabriel's already here, ready to make this a bloodbath. These psychedelic transitions were done by Industrial Light and Magic, which handled all the VFX in the film. To melt away from Maddie's world into a soon-to-be victims, they'd film against a blue screen and insert blended scans of the rooms being transitioned into and out of. This idea was inspired by the Giallo-esque Eyes of Laura Mars, in which a woman played by Faye Dunaway could see through the eyes of a killer. It was written by John Carpenter and also stars Tommy Lee Jones and Brad Dourif, I gotta see this. Kakoa goes to Dr. Gregory's apartment, which probably has more seating than his waiting room. Got enough couches, dude? He finds the doctor's eviscerated body soaking in the tub. Didn't I warn y'all about James Wan and bathrooms? Maddie sees Kakoa walk in, but the psychic connection only goes one way, so she's unable to scream, Kakoa! Kakoa! and warn him about the serial killer on the ceiling. Gabriel attacks the detective, who manages to fight him off, showing he isn't imaginary. Imaginary people don't need to run away on foot. The acrobatic assassin flees down the fire escape, treating gravity like they in a video game. Kakoa can't quite match those moves, but he does catch up with a leap of faith. Aw oh shit, Kakoa, you a badass. He chases Gabriel into the Seattle underground, and follows him so far he ends up in the further. Gabriel attacks him from the top of a stagecoach, but Kakoa's no John Wayne, and fails to land a shot on the fleeing murderer. The detectives decide to help jog Maddie's memory by bringing in a hypnotherapist. She's played by Paula Marshall, who we saw as Terry in Hellraiser 3. Good to see her again. Under a trance, Maddie recalls a moment from her childhood when she was blamed for some sugary sabotage. You ruined your mother's cake. I didn't, it was Gabriel! Stop. Her father 
father here is played by Andy Bean, who was adult Stan in It Chapter 2, while young Maddie is played by 13-year-old McKenna Grace, whose career is already full of horror, including The Haunting of Hill House, Annabelle Comes Home, and an Amityville movie. She's a pro at playing younger versions of characters. Tanya Harding, Sabrina the Witch, Captain Marvel, and even Daphne. Young Maddie gets a phone call from Gabriel, who suggests she nab herself a slice of cake. Before she can cut in, a familiar transition reveals that she's actually about to cut into her unborn sister. Love the interest in obstetrics, Maddie, but that bun needs more time in the oven. The flashback makes adult Maddie scream like Tony Collette at a seance. <laughs> Well, I think that's about all the time we have for today. But at least Maddie learned Gabriel is the killer. Wait, are you saying that the killer is your imaginary friend? Elsewhere, maybe, that tied up tour guide manages to free herself. Before she can do much more, she falls through a rickety floor, directly into Maddie's living room. Holy shit! It's a twist that doesn't make a ton of sense. Why you got that big ass fan up there, Mad Mad? And where the hell is it on the outside of the house? But fuck it, I still think it's great. And it gives us this awesome long shot as Maddie is arrested. Sydney is sure of her sister's innocence, but the detectives aren't convinced. The murder weapon and giallo jacket in her attic don't help. They bring Maddie in for interrogation, but Gabriel soon interrupts with his classic combo of messed up lights and a menace phone call. Hello, detective. Oh snap, you wanna play a game? Kakoa don't, so the detectives keep Maddie in this GTA holding cell while they continue their investigation. With the cops against them, Sydney's forced to investigate on her own. She uses Maddie's adoption agency to trace her back to Simeon, the spooky hospital from the cold open. Uh, Sydney, wanna break? Jesus Christ, what you doing parking all the way at the ass end of this cliff? Inside, she has to descend into a pants-shittingly creepy basement to find... Oh, it's Maddie's file. That was easy. And some videotapes too? Well, great. She takes the tapes to her mom's for a family movie night. The first one is of a teenage girl named Serena May, who's revealed to be Maddie's supposedly deceased birth mother. She's also, as this cross dissolve tells us, the Jane Doe tour guide who was tied up in Maddie's attic. This is Madison's birth mother. Once again, thank you, Kakoa. Sydney slots in the next tape, an interview with Maddie, back when she went by her birth name, Emily May. It's revealed that Gabriel can influence Maddie's thoughts, as well as give her super strength. Gabriel makes me strong. I thought Gabriel was only in Maddie's head. <sighs> Oh shit, he is! But like, literally! Dr. Weaver explains that Gabriel is basically a tumor living off Maddie's body. He's a parasitic twin who failed to separate in the womb, so he's cursed to a Voldemortish half-life on the back of her skull. It's an extreme take on teratomas, real-life tumors that can grow teeth, hair, and even eyes. Ingrid Bisu read about them and took the idea to James Wan, and together, they developed this. Because they're conjoined at the brain, removing Gabriel entirely would have killed Maddie. So instead, Weaver brought in Doctors Fields and Gregory, who sliced away what they could and just kind of stuffed the rest of him back into Maddie's skull, like it were an overflowing trash can. Additional tapes reveal that Gabriel can access Maddie's vision, explaining these supposedly psychic trips that she's been having. In reality, those have just been hallucinatory distractions that allow Gabriel to control Maddie's body while keeping her none the wiser. He was awoken from his decades-long slumber when Derek bashed Maddie's head against the wall, and immediately set out to get his revenge on the doctors who cut him out like a cancer. If the situation sounds familiar, then you know you're called classics, or at least are a studious little meaty. This is, in fact, the exact plot of Frank Henenlotter's Basket Case, which is one of the best worst things ever made. Seriously, if you haven't seen it, I mean you gotta. It's become a part of Dead Meat lore. Belial is my little Twitch guy after all, and last Halloween, Chelsea and I dressed as Gabriel and Dwayne from Basket Case. Her Gabriel was terrifying, thanks to the mask made by our friend Ivo Trees, which I'm reusing here on the set. The movie's Gabriel is a combination of practical and digital effects. In the videotape, McKenna Grace is wearing a dummy made by a team at Spectral Motion, working under project manager Kevin McTurk. The only digital effect in this scene is the VHS distortion, done by compositing supervisor Charles Lai. Back in the prison cell, Maddie's in some deep red shit, getting harassed by a prisoner named Scorpion. She's played by New Zealand stuntwoman Zoe Bell, a Quentin Tarantino regular. Things devolve until Scorpion and this superfly chick start tenderizing the fresh meat. Damn man, where are the guards? The abuse causes sparks to fly, and Maddie gets up as Gabriel tags in. He starts peeling off the back of her head. Jesus Christ, where are the guards? We get a proper look at Gabriel the Living Tumor as he peekaboos through Maddie's skull, revealing the killer's unnatural movement as a result of Maddie's body being piloted backwards. With Gabriel fully at the wheel, he kicks things off by ripping out the throat of Beta, the disco inmate who is very much not staying alive. Gabriel proceeds to fucking massacre this cell block tank 
tangle of ladies. Though, to be fair, most of them had it coming. He punches through stomachs, snaps bones, and stomps heads. Good God Almighty, where are the guards? While Scorpion screams for the friendship code, Gabriel fatalities and brutalities the other women off screen. When an officer finally comes to check out all the screaming, we see nine additional bodies, give or take a couple odd limbs. Damn, Gabriel. Gabriel lifts Scorpion up by the eye sockets and uses her body as a shield against the officer's gun. I guess she's neither bullet nor death proof. Gabe then grabs the copper and bashes his head into the bars, and I'll count that as a kill too. If it's good enough for Officer Mooney, it's good enough for me. The cell block sequence was rehearsed for a week under fight coordinator Lloyd Bateman. It involved wire work, a whole lot of stunts, and gnarly special effects by Spectral Motion. For the head stomp, they used a puppet filled with blood and gore, which was then slightly augmented by ILM's digital effects. Down in the evidence locker, Winnie hears the commotion and hides as Gabriel busts in to retrieve his belongings. Gabriel's backwards movement was achieved using two contortionists, Marina Mazeppa, who was on the 14th season of America's Got Talent, and Troy James, who was previously on the kill count as the jangly man in Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Juan would switch the doubles out scene to scene, depending on whether he wanted the character to feel more like Maddie or more like Gabriel. Most of us don't think about how to walk when you walk, and all of a sudden now you're thinking, wait, is it left arm forward, right leg first, or trying to be natural but backwards. Sometimes though, like the fire escape scene, a full CG Gabriel was used, created by ILM based on motion capture scans of Marina Mazeppa. The Ukrainian Mazeppa seemed to shoulder most of the work, performing stunts while wearing a fully articulated animatronic mask. She wore a mechanical rig on her chest that allowed the effects team to operate Gabriel's face. That's what's so impressive. Gabriel's nasty face is mostly a practical head designed by Mark Satrakian. ILM's minor digital adjustments included adding a skull layer, adjusting the edges of the wound, and exaggerating the animatronic's expressions. Kakoa and Moss return to find three popo that are no mo in the locker room. This is just the calm before the storm though, because Gabriel is the natural born killer. He stabs three more poor bastards who happen to be standing by the doors. He then kicks off an incredible one filled with hacking, slashing, and a sprinkling of friendly fire that takes the lives of six more officers. While Samara is weaving around with ease, dodging bullets like he's the one, Kakoa Koa and Moss pass by two more bodies on their way in. While they try to provide backup, Gabriel slaughters pretty much everyone else in the precinct. Damn, Seattle's gonna be having processions for like a week straight. There's one more detective whom Gabriel aggressively disarms, but I won't count her as a kill. He gets distracted before finishing her, and I'm assuming she's saved by medical personnel. This iconic sequence at the police station is another achievement of fight coordinator Bateman and stunt coordinator Glenn Foster, who's been the stunt double for Robert Downey Jr. Everything had to be perfect on the mark, since the scene was filmed using a pre-programmed robotic camera that would move around to follow the choreography. Here, Gabriel was played by stunt double Solomon Brendy, who performed the scene in a motion capture suit so a digital model could be added in post. Solomon Brendy want kills too! Gabriel lands critical hits on both Kakoa and Moss, then makes another instant horror memory by sniping them across the room with a fucking chair. Hell yeah! Chairs! He must be feeling charitable, since he leaves without finishing them off. Winnie finds the detective duo and delivers another hilarious line. Why am I calling the police? As she gets medical attention from Moss, Kakoa rushes towards the hospital, where Sydney just arrived to see Serena May after learning that she's Maddie's birth mother. A grumpy security guard gets in Sydney's way, but a psychic blast from Grinchy Gabriel makes his pacemaker grow three sizes that day and explode. The half boy appears and slashes at Sydney like this were Scream, but before he can finish the job, Kakoa arrives, guns all ablazing. Kakoa, the island that shoots like a Man. Gabriel puts the detective down, but not out, then flips a whole goddamn hospital bed onto Sydney. Injured, she tries reaching out to her sister by revealing one last sick and twisted revelation. Gabriel's been the cause of all her miscarriages. He was feeding off of your fetuses to build himself back up! Yep, that line was written and delivered in a $40 million movie. I love it. Maddie tries to turn control of her body up to 11, hoping to stop Gabriel and save her sister. Yo, what? No, Gabriel, stop this shit! Quit killing Maddie's family because you lime green jello! Luckily, there's no need to rewind like funny games, since it turns out this time, Gabriel is the one in the mind prison. Maddie reveals that their connection goes two ways. Did you forget? <clears throat> 
We share the same brain. Gabriel tries to reason with his sister, saying he didn't ask to be tied to her body. And besides, he can drive it better anyway. She ain't having it though, and traps the talking tumor in this Bob Fosse prison of his own mind. Maddie regains control of her body, symbolizing the feminist theme Juan and Bisu wanted to emphasize. She single-handedly frees Sydney from beneath the hospital bed, saying that she's had Gabriel's strength all along. Or maybe it's the Promisen. As Serena looks on, Maddie wraps up her character arc with some sisterly love. All my life, I've yearned for a blood connection with someone, blood or not. You will always be my sister. The movie ends as the sisters embrace, with an electrical hum signaling that Gabriel isn't entirely gone. How many victims did this cancer cut out? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Hello, James A. Janice. Gabriel? <laughs> Hey man, I've been meaning to ask you, what's the deal with you controlling electricity and shit? Uh, uh, never mind. I've waited so long for you to count these kills. Well, it's an honor, man. I'm a really big fan. Oh, really? Let's see if you still say that when I make you dead meat. <laughs> Forty-six people died in Malignant, with the victims consisting of 22 men and 24 women, giving us an impressively equal pie chart considering the number of bodies. Also, mildly interesting that out of 358 kill counts, this is the first one with 46 victims. With a runtime of 111 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 2.41 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill, collectively, to the six officers killed in Gabriel's incredible one-take kill streak. Seriously inspired stuff there. For lamest kill, we'll go to that slow ass motherfucking guard who got his head bashed against some bars. Dude, where were you? And that's it. Malignant came out in 2021. It didn't do great at the box office and was a little divisive among fans, but a lot of us loved it. It got more nominations at the Dead Meat Horror Awards than any other movie that year. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey, thanks for watching this Kill Count on Malignant. Huge thanks to Ray Chase for once again lending his vocal talents to this channel. We are such big fans of Malignant in this house, and I'm so glad he got to be part of The Kill Count for it. This jacket is in fact a Neo jacket from when Chelsea and I dressed as Neo and Trinity one time. And in fact, it's the same dress form as the Littlefinger costumes Chelsea used to make me when we would cosplay Game of Thrones characters. I want to thank some patrons like Tyler Brown 38 STK Holy Glue, Jesse Saffron, Ramona Gothic, the Mad One, Dakota Cardi, and Viviana Salinas. Thanks everyone, be good people.